lead stage, thousands are still without power following the horrific tornadoes. Three twisters have touched down just south of town. And now, a rolling motion. I believe we're having an earthquake. I have never before seen such horrific weather. I advise you to take cover immediately. This week's lesson focuses on earth closing event. Our memory verse this week comes from the book of Proverbs 23 verse 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Second Peter chapter 1, Peter states that the apostolic witness is not based on cunning devised story but on direct personal experience. The verse confirms that the Bible is reliable and authentic testimony about Jesus. They saw his glory firsthand, which formed the foundation of their message. Peter stresses the importance of prophecy in verse 19, stating that we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to the light shining in the dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, the prophetic word is presented as a garden light to a dark times, offering hope and direction. It is through this prophetic message that believers can find assurance and clarity about God's plan, especially as we approach the end time. Ellen G. White elaborate this in great controversy. It's a long quote, but please bear with me. The people of God are directed to the scripture as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of the spirit of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deception. The last great delusion is soon to open up before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous work in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scripture. None but those who have fortified their mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the, the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Will I obey God rather than man? The decisive hour is now, is even now at hand. Our, our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word. Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandment of God and the faith of Jesus? Great Controversy 593 and 594. To stand in the final crisis, we need to find our mind fortified with the truth of the Bible. This involves regular, in-depth study of God's word, applying its principles in our life. It also requires a personal relationship with Jesus, who is the embodiment of the truth Many distractions may keep us from studying God's word, such as business of life, entertainment, social media, and pursuit of personal ambition. 
This distraction can lead us to compromise truth for personal pleasure, prioritizing our desire over God's commandment. To overcome these distractions, we must intentionally set aside time to study the Bible and pray, seeking guidance of the Holy Spirit. By immersing ourselves in the Bible, we are strengthening our faith and preparing to stand firm in defense of truth amid the deception of the last days. Our loyalty to God and His Word will be tested by our grounding ourselves in the Bible. We can discern truth from error and remain faithful unto the end. September 11, 2001, days after the September 11 attacks, President George W. Bush gave the CIA the authority to capture, detain, and kill Al-Qaeda operatives around the world. In 2002, February, President Bush signed an executive order stating that the Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention, which prevent the mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture, does not apply to Al-Qaeda and Taliban captives. In March and April 2002, Abu Zubaydah was captured in Pakistan and transferred to CIA custody at Guantanamo Bay. He was interrogated jointly by the FBI and the CIA officers. The CIA used enhanced interrogation technique designed by Dr. James Mitchell during the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah and other detainees. This technique include beating, banding in concocted stress position, holding, sleep deprivation, destruction to the point of hallucination, and infamous waterboarding. In January 2003, the CIA Inspector General began an investigation of the program. In May 2004, the CIA Inspector General completed a report challenging the legality of some of the interrogation methods. Now, the success and the moral ground of the enhanced interrogation technique program are highly debatable, but the reason for the program is understood and agreed upon by many. Dr. James Mitchell, the originator of the program, claimed that these terrorists are so dedicated and loyal to their cause that no amount of smooth talk will cause them to change their mind and betray the organization. He asserted that the only chance to break them is through these enhanced interrogation techniques. In other words, these techniques are the only means to force them to change their mind even if they do not want to. But we read in the book of Revelation chapter 16, 9, 8 and 9 about the fourth angel pouring out his devil upon the earth and causing men to be scorched with great heat. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun and power was given upon him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which has power over the plagues and they repented not to give him glory. Despite this extreme suffering, when the test says that they blasphemed the name of God which has power over these plagues and they did not repent to give him glory. This stubbornness highlights a critical truth. The heart of the wicked are so hardened that even the severest punishment from God could not break them to change their mind. You contrast that with the book of Revelation chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 it speaks of those who came out of the great tribulation having washed their robe in the blood of the Lamb. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these who are arrayed in white robe? And hence came they. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they who came out of great tribulation and have washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This group of people also endure great tribulation 
and remain faithful as their faith is depicted as unshakable in their loyalty to God. You cannot break them. Their minds are made up and their commitment to Christ is unyielding even in the face of intense persecution and trial. In the end, we can label ourselves all we want, conservative, liberal, mainstream, you know, leaning, conservative, leaning, liberal, undecided. It boils down to this, those who are sealed by God and those who are marked by the beast and whose mind is made up about their decision. But what is the seal of God? In ancient times, seal attests to the authenticity of official document. They are distinctive individual individualized marks. Since the final conflict centers on worship and God's authority as revealed in his law, we will expect God's seal to be embedded in his law. So when we read the book of Exodus chapter 28 verse 8 to 11, we find a Sabbath commandment which contains three elements of an authentic seal. The name of the Lord, his title as creator, and his dominance over heaven and earth. The Sabbath is God's sign of authority and the test of our loyalty. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 to 12 show the importance of worshiping the creator and warn against worshiping the beast. The observance of Sabbath is central to this message as it is a sign of true worship and our allegiance to God. Ellen White right? as we near the close of time, the demarcation between the children of light and the children of darkness will be more and more decided. They will be more and more at variance. Special testimony to Battery Creek and also found in last day event, page 215, paragraph 3. She also wrote again in, in the same book, True observance of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to God. And this is found in last day event 220. As we approach the final crisis, the distinction between those who are sealed by God and those who are marked by the beast will be become clearer. Our daily choices, our faithful in small things, our commitment to God's commandment, particularly the Sabbath, will determine our place in the cosmic conflict. Let us strive to be among those who are marked by God, faithfully observing His Sabbath and living life that reflect the character of Jesus. By doing so, we will be prepared to stand firm in the coming crisis and receive the seal of the living God, ensuring our place in His eternal kingdom. In the last day, worship will be at the center stage of the great controversy. Do we worship the Creator or do we worship the beast and his image? That will be the question to answer. There will be no middle ground. Revelation 14, the first angel calls humanity to worship him who made heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. This divine call further emphasize the third angels who warns of severe consequence of worshiping the beast, stating that those who do so will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Creation is foundation of true worship, as highlighted in the book of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. God, who created all things through Jesus, as recorded in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, faces the enemy of Satan who despised the Creator. Satan sought to alter the Sabbath, the memorial of creation, through earthly powers, as prophesied in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. The impending conflict over God's law centers on the issues of authority. If Satan can eliminate the Sabbath worship, he will claim that his authority surpasses that of God. To achieve this, Satan will attempt to persuade or force the entire world in accepting the counterfeit Sabbath. Someone will say, ah, that is not possible, especially in our world. Don't look that far back. Just look at what happened during the COVID crisis. It shows us overnight our world can become a different place. The corruption of humanity 
and the evil that humans are capable of doing illustrate how easily final event could come about. History is full of examples of how quickly society can turn to violent and oppress under the right condition. The instability, moral decline, and the technological advancement in our world today make the rapid fulfillment of biblical prophecy not only possible but probable. This sovereign reality should teach us the importance of guarding our heart. Above all, guard your heart, for everything you do flow from it. We must be vigilant in our spiritual life, continuing seeking to align our thought and action with God's will by immersing ourselves in Scripture, praying for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, nurturing our relationship with Christ. We can fortify ourselves against the deception and remain faithful in the face of the end time challenge. The final conflict of our worship will test our allegiance to God. As we prepare for these times, let us commit to worshiping the Creator and keeping His commandment and cultivating deep personal faith that can withstand the pressure and the deception of the last days. The Bible uses agricultural metaphor, particularly the concept of early and the latter rain, as we will see, to describe God's work on earth and the spiritual outpouring that will complete His mission on earth. The early and the latter rain in Israel have a cycle teaches us that lesson. In ancient Israel, the agricultural cycle was critically dependent on the early and the latter rains. The early rain, this rain fell in the autumn, softening the soil for planting seeds. The latter rain, this rain fell in the spring, maturing crop for harvest. These rains were essential for successful harvest, and the Bible uses them metaphorically to describe the spiritual blessing necessary for God's work on earth. Israel has no control over the rain and depend on God to provide the right amount of rain at the right time for a successful farming. So it is the same way of the work of the Holy Spirit for the proclamation of the gospel. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the, be at the opening or beginning of the gospel, it causes the offspring of the precious seed. So the latter rain will be given at the close for the wrapping of the harvest. So prophet Zechariah writes in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, Not by might, not by power, by the Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. This verse points to the fact that God's work will be accomplished not through human strength or effort, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The early rain represents the initial pollen of the Holy Spirit, which began at Pentecost and empowered the early church. The church now wait for the outpouring of the latter rain, to finish the work the apostolic church started. Let's pray for the latter rain, the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will mature the church and prepare it for the final harvest. This spiritual rain is crucial for the church to complete its mission on earth. The work will be completed not because we have enough money for the mission budget, but because we have open heart to receive the Holy Spirit. The work of God on earth will be finished through divine outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like the early and the latter rain. The completion of God's work relies not on human might, but on spiritual empowerment. Human effort, no matter how well intentioned or resourceful, have their limit. Our, our abilities, resources, strategies, while valuable, are insufficient for the monumental task of fulfilling God's mission. The scope of God's work require more than human effort alone can achieve. God is directly involved in his mission. Actually, he is the head of the mission. It is through the spirit that believers are empowered, guided, and equipped to accomplish what will be impossible through human means alone. Divine intervention is not just helpful, it's essential. The book of Revelation provides clarity of God's final work on earth particularly in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 to 4. The passage reveals how God will bring his mission to completion through a combination of divine intervention, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the call to his people to separate from a corrupt systems. The passage in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 to 4 says, After these things, I saw another angel 
coming down from heaven, having a great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place for demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nation has drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth has committed fornication with her, and the merchant of the earth has become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plague. We see from the test, the angel comes from comes down from heaven with great authority, illuminating the earth with his glory. He carries a powerful and authoritative message that will be proclaimed worldwide. From the Adventist perspective, this represents the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, often referred to as a ladder rain, which will empower God's people to deliver a gospel message with unprecedented clarity and power. The illumination of the earth with the angels' glory showed the global reach of this final message. The message is not localized or limited in scope. It will penetrate every part of the world, from Papua New Guinea to New Zealand, from Ethiopia to India. The final spread of the gospel will reach every nation, tribe, language, and people, ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to hear and respond to God's final call. The earth being illuminated suggests that the final proclamation will reveal God's truth in its fullness, expelling the darkness of deception and ignorance. This illumination will expose the lies of Babylon and bring to light the pure truth of God's word, leading people to a clear understanding of his will. The angel declaration that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Babylon the Great points to the judgment and the eventual destruction of the corrupt system that have led nation astray. In Adventist perspective, Babylon symbolizes false religion system and alliances that oppose God's truth. The deception of Babylon as a dwelling place for demons and impure spirit highlights the death of its corruption. This proclamation serves to expose the deception and the moral decay inherent in this system, calling people to recognize their true nature. Then there was a voice from heaven. There is this voice, this voice from heaven calling, come out of her, my people, is a direct appeal from God to his faithful to separate themselves from corrupt influence of Babylon. God makes the final appeal, come out from her, my people. The important is that if you are indeed the child of God, you will hear that voice and you come out of battle.